The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Then Jesus said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will see it. They will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go. Do not set off in pursuit. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must endure much suffering and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed all of them. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on that day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed all of them. It will be like that on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away, and likewise anyone in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding meal together, one will be taken and the other left. Then they asked him, where, Lord? He said to them, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Picture the scene. A camera pans in over a desolate desert, sand and rocks, a few cacti, and not much else. A man is hiking alone and has lost the trail. The sun is blazing, it's a hundred degrees, and he's just about out of water. In his exhaustion and dehydration, he stumbles and falls, and you wonder if that, this man will survive. All of a sudden, you hear a screech and the camera pans up into the blue sky. And what do you see circling menacingly overhead? Vultures, right? Vultures circling high above, just waiting for the man to die so they can swoop in and feast. Chilling. If I were to do a, a poll of your top three favorite birds, I'm guessing the vulture wouldn't make anyone's list. I want to read you a paragraph from the vulture chapter in Consider the Birds by Debbie Blue to give you her initial description of the vulture. New World vultures projectile vomit into the face of anything that startles them. They eat excrement, especially human, and dead bodies. They defecate over their own legs. Most vultures are bald. This allows them to stick their entire heads inside a carcass without feathers to foul with blood and rotting flesh. A turkey vulture has very large and obvious nostrils. It's possible to see through from one side of its head to the other. This is not pretty. It's weird and scary. Vultures' heads are often disproportionately small compared to their bodies. This is not attractive. They sit hunched up with their heads sunk between their shoulders like a sulking teenager. They eat so much dead flesh at a meal that they're too heavy to fly, so they sit with their rough tongues in their mouths, hissing and grunting, waiting to digest. Vultures aren't just ugly birds. They're scary looking, and they've come to represent death because, well, they eat dead things, almost exclusively. We see them as the grim reaper of the bird world but vultures almost never kill to eat. They're scavengers, they're eaters of carrion, of carcasses, dining on the dead. Even in the Bible, the vulture is not seen as a beautiful creature. It's one of the birds God's people were forbidden to eat, probably because it was unclean, since it eats rotting animals. And the vulture often intimidates people, since it's always ready to swoop down upon any carcass and quickly tear apart its flesh. In fact, God used the vulture as a threat in Deuteronomy. To those who didn't obey God's laws, God says, your corpses shall be 
food for every bird of the air, vultures, and animal of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. Yikes. In fact, that's why speedy burial of bodies was so important throughout the Bible, because there was nothing less dignified for a dead person than to be left in the elements to be consumed by wild birds like some biblical roadkill. Even in our reading today, Jesus uses the vulture as a frightening metaphor of the end times. He gives examples of people living their normal lives, not paying attention to what's going on around them, specifically not knowing, noticing the Messiah's coming. He encourages people to keep alert and focused on God because where the corpse is, vultures will gather. Yikes. Jesus, couldn't you just talk about some lovely doves or sparrows? I think most of us would be just fine not thinking about vultures ever again. They're ugly, they're gross, they're awkward and kind of terrifying. Until we hear a story like this. In India, vultures used to be abundant, feasting on carrion and carcasses all over. But then people started to feed their cattle a certain painkiller. No big deal, right? Except when those cattle would eventually die and be left out in the elements to, for the elements to handle, they discovered that cattle painkiller was poisonous to the vultures that fed on the carcasses. So millions of vultures died, which presented a problem. Without the vultures taking care of the rotting carcasses, occurrences of anthrax skyrocketed, as well as rabies and other diseases. Why? Because without competition from the vulture, wild dogs took over eating the carcasses. So their numbers grew, and they came in much closer contact with people and other animals, which caused the dogs to spread diseases to people and their animals. The Indian, Indian government finally banned that painkiller and started conservation efforts to bring back the vultures even opening vulture restaurants to nurture the next generation of carcass eaters. You see, while vultures may look ugly and seem disgusting, they have a unique ability. In addition to their puny, bald heads being designed to dive right into a carcass to feast, their stomachs are perfectly equipped to deal with rotting flesh. Their digestive juices can break down and neutralize bacteria and pathogens that could spread disease to others. So by the time their food leaves their bodies, it's non-toxic, it's purified. By eating what's repulsive to us, vultures actually purify and cleanse the world. In fact, the turkey vulture, the main vulture we have here in the Midwest, has the scientific name Cathartes Aura, which literally means the golden purifier. The ugliness that they eat comes out cleansed. In fact, vultures de deliberately urinate on their own legs because it cleans them. So how y'all doing? Doing okay? I know that's, that's very weird. A lot of stomach-turning stuff you probably weren't expecting to hear about in church today, but stick with me. While you may not be excited to see a vulture in your backyard, the vulture represents an important part in the circle of life that God created, doing the essential work of cleaning up the messes of mortality, leaving the earth cleaner and purer. So maybe that might help us to see a bit of beauty in an otherwise ugly-looking animal. And actually, in other cultures, the vulture has a more positive reputation. Ancient Egyptians saw the vulture as the great mother god, a big protective goddess in the sky that flew high, enfolding and protecting all. In Tibet, vultures are seen as important parts of creation, as people are. And since Tibet is rocky and mountainous, burying their dead in the ground is near impossible. And with not much wood there for cremation, Buddhists in Tibet have often practiced sky burial. When someone dies, their body is taken to a mountain, 
and a service is held for them. Then the body is left there to become part of nature again. They call it jator, or alms to the birds. While being consumed by birds and other animals may sound horrifying or humiliating to us and other cultures, in Buddhist thinking, this offering is a person's last act of generosity to creation, being offered to sustain other living things, which surely includes vultures. Just like we might leave money or property to people that we love, they leave their own bodies for all of creation because they love it. Where we might think it sounds savage to them, alms to the birds is the ultimate act of compassion and oneness with creation. They become part of the circle of life that exists past their own earthly lives. And while this particular practice may seem odd or even repugnant to us, we participate in rituals that may, might be as odd or repugnant to others. In a few moments, you'll be invited to come forward to remember a man who willingly took on all of the filth and muck and sin of this world upon himself and died to purify people like us who are responsible for that filth and sin. His death was also ugly and repugnant. But the ugliness of Jesus' death turned into beauty that Sunday morning as Jesus rose from the dead. You might say that Jesus ate death in order to bring the joy and purity of new life to us. You'll be invited to eat and drink his flesh, his blood, a practice that disgusted and scandalized the world that he died for. It may seem a more neat and sanitary meal than it sounds, but regardless of what the meal looks like, Jesus is present in that bread and that wine. We take him into our own bodies in hopes that he can purify us and save us. In eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood, you will be strengthened, purified, forgiven, and united with his people which is a beautiful thing indeed.